And the second one is Harry's death scene. Harry was Brian and Andrew and Rory's father, and he dies when his remaining children are 18 and 23, something like that. And they're home uh, with their father. Time plays funny tricks on the dying. Sometimes it speeds up like a train that's pulling away from the station, just as you burst through the gate, ticket in hand, and it hits you that if you'd arrived a mere 10 seconds earlier, you'd be on it, bound for that place you always yearn for, the place you just knew would change your life from something ordinary to something so exquisite you can only guess at it. Dang, if only the phone hadn't rung on your way out the door. If only you hadn't forgotten your keys and had to run back in for them. If only you remembered that Montclair Road, Montclair Road was closed for construction. But sometimes time seems to grind to a halt so that you, the dying person, can lose sight of how long you've been in this particular state, in this particular bed, in this particular room. Nor can you recall how long it's been since you've seen the face or heard the voice of another human being, or for that matter, heard any sound at all, except for the beeping above your bed that tells you that you still barely inhabit this world. How is it that no one has figured out that you might like to be in your own bed for such a momentous event? There's surely nothing anyone could do for you here. But really, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter. If you keep your eyes closed, you can imagine you are at home, in your own bedroom and in your own bed, where you slept with Olivia, such a brief time you had with her, and later with Tony. Oh, why hadn't you loved her more? But it's difficult to think about all of this now. As a matter of fact, you're having trouble thinking at all, in, at least in any systematic, sequential fashion, with one thought leading to another. Earlier, you heard the boys talking. Brian was saying, I can't understand a thing he says. And Rory responded, yeah, it's like he's on a different plane. The boys, your boys. And now you feel a pang in your heart. And as you reach for it, you manage to catch hold of another thought. Regret that you've worried so much about Brian and so little about Rory with his insatiable need to please everyone. You could have helped him. That thought evaporates and you realize that your boys were right. You are on a different plane. Your thoughts are all jumbled up but they're wrong if they think you can't feel them. Why really, your feelings are so much better than thoughts. They're almost pictures. Right now, on your back under the covers, the image you see is that of your mother. She is wearing a purple hat and laughing. Her bingo hat, she'd always called it, but she wore it everywhere, to ladies' teas, to supper bridge club, to masks, and of course, to bingo. She appears to you clear as day. As a matter of fact, you can tell from the way her lipstick has been applied that she's had a few. She was so full of sorrow those years before she died. She couldn't fathom going on without your father, but she knew her sadness had to do with the fact that you had renounced your faith shortly after you met Olivia and you'd stuck to your guns. You refused a church wedding, even though you knew how much it meant to her. She'd been so convinced on her deathbed that she'd never see you again. But here she is anyway, and not a minute too soon, so close that you can make out the crucifix that is always hung from her neck, the tiny Jesus with his arms outstretched, the palms of his hands pinned to the cross. You twist your fingers together and with a huge effort manage to make a thought. You'd like to summon a priest, but it's too late for that. You can finally feel, you, feel yourself going. And besides, it doesn't matter, it's just silliness. All the same though, and just in case, you trace with the thumb of one hand onto the palm of the other, the four points of the cross. It's so nice to be here to get to celebrate in person your debut novel. And I'm so glad I get to ask you a few questions about it. We'll go right in right group here. So let's just jump in. Um, I would love to know where and how long ago this book, this idea started for you. It started a long time ago. I have three sons, four sons, but there were only three back then. Uh, they were all little. It started at a resort, not in Vermont, in New York, New York State. Um, when I f was coming back to the resort after taking a hike, similar to what Olivia did, and looked through the trees at my children and other people on the dock and wondered what would happen if I found out that one of them, one of them had died or drowned. And I thought to myself, I might walk out of my life. Mm -hmm. So I started it. Um, and I, I made a short story out of it, and the short story was a little too long, 
<laughs> and I put it away thinking, well, I got too long a short story. What am I going to do with it? Uh, and then my husband suggested that I make it into a novel. And that was decades later. So that's how it came to be. Wow. Yeah. wow. And, um, you know, you've mentioned Olivia. The novel begins with her, right? Um, she makes a hard choice, as you said. She decides, like, like you had this thought experiment. What if? What would I do, right? And I think even from just what you read, those few short pages, we get a sense Olivia is not an absent mother, right? She paints things on the ceiling. Um, she's very present. Um, what can you tell us about her? Or if you don't want us to tell us anything, you want to tell us anything, um, what, what is your hope that people get from her, from Olivia? I think she's an introvert, but I think she's very happy. She, as you say, she's very creative. She does music as well as paint ceilings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and she was looking forward to going to New York with the family. They were going to move there, and she was going to get involved in the music there. Um, she was happy. Yeah, she was happy. She was happy for a while. Yeah. Um, and what do you think about her making that hard choice that she makes? Um, I wouldn't have made it. Yeah. <laughs> At least I don't think I would have made it. I would have been tempted. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of reaction about from people who think, oh my goodness, I can't finish this book. I can't believe this woman would do that. And um, I don't judge her for it. Mm -hmm. You know, her grief, she tried to run from her grief and she took it with her her whole life because yeah. she can't run from grief. That's right. right. Yeah. And what, I think what I appreciated about her is that Olivia really shows the whole expanse of what motherhood is, all the feelings you have, right? They go from good and bad. To, yeah, to grief to also, also these very kind of morose fears that you have that, yeah. that she has as well. Um, because you were writing about, you know, loss and trauma and all those things, what, what would you say would, was the hardest part of writing this book for you? Well, not thinking about loss or trauma or anything, the hardest part of writing, and this is my first novel, uh, was, was the first draft of it. Uh, you have to pull it out of somewhere. Where do you pull it out of, you know? You get an idea, but then you have to construct a whole world. And that was tough. But the easiest part was editing, ah. uh, getting to fiddle around with words. This one, no, it should go here. That one, no, no, don't want that one. That's, it's like doing a puzzle yeah. until you get it perfect or as perfect as you think you're going to get it. And how do you usually write your first drafts? Are they, do you do it by hand? Do you oh, no. Do you well, do you do nothing by hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I do it on the laptop. Yeah. But I edit very often in bed at night on my little phone. Because I can, see how many words are there on your phone? You can see each one's in each one. One can stand out on an iPhone, and it's not the right word, whereas it wouldn't have stood out to you on a laptop, because you know all you're looking at is 25 words or something. Right. You can look at each one, and, I, and I'm a perfectionist. It needs to be the most perfect word. Mm -hmm. So. And I write in emails to myself at night saying my character should do such and such a thing. <laughs> Sometimes in the morning I get a lot of emails from myself. <laughs> it wrecks my sleep. Yeah. You know, that's so interesting to hear because I think one of the really wonderful things about your writing style is that each sentence kind of contains its own world. So to hear that that's how you edit is sort of, you know, really word by word, sentence yeah. by sentence, yeah. that really comes across in the, yeah. in the, in the finished product, I think. What was the what was the best part of writing the book? Oh boy! Oh, so so much of it was great. I mean, finding out what the ending was going to be. I didn't know at the beginning what the ending was going to be. Yeah, it just sort of came to me as I went along. Mm -hmm. And even I got to the ending and I kept changing it. Yeah, like, I'm not going to say any more than that because I'm sure there are some people who have read it. I, by the way, there will be a quiz after. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you how did you know when you got that ending that that was the right one? Oh, boy. it's really hard, yeah. right? As a as a writer, you have so much control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I don't know that that. Well, I think of a curve of a book. You you write a book and it has a curve, just like a piece of music. And you, one of your questions, yeah, asking yeah. about music. Um, so it kind of goes along. You pick out what's going to happen and you bring it up to here three quarters of the way to the end or or much more and then and then you let it down lightly mm -hmm. right and but you have to figure out all those things that get to you so say you know what's at the top of the curve 
and and it's an emotional experience. It's always an emotional thing in a novel. And then you have to figure out all the little emotional experiences that get you to that, and then that get you off of that. Mm -hmm. You can't just stop when it, when you're right up here at the climax. Otherwise, your your readers will just drop down to the floor. I mean. They won't be able to get back to their ordinary life unless you let them down a little gently. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. You are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I did want to ask you about music because I think that the way the book was written has yeah. some musicality in the prose. You know, you can you can sort of hear it. It's nice to as you're reading to kind of picture, even hearing you read it out loud. Um, do you have? Can you share us like what your history is with music itself? Do you play an instrument? Yeah, yeah. I from the age of five, I played piano. And I wanted to play seriously. I did play seriously. Um, I had an accident severing a tendon when I was 14. So that was kind of the end of my career if I would have even had one. But I still played. And when we moved to Canada, um, I started organ. Oh. Well, after we moved to Canada. Um, I thought it would be easy, but it turned out because I could play piano, but it, it's not like that. Um, and then I, I got a church. I started doing the funeral home and doing supply services. And then I got my own church. Mm -hmm. And then I got to be almost 70. And I kept thinking that novel that I was going to write all my life, um, where is it? Like, mm -hmm. it's, I'm 70. Isn't it about time I wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I kind of quit, not quit the organ. We moved down here and I didn't get another church. I decided I would not. I was going to write. I'm a writer down here, a musician in Canada. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what was the question? I well, I do um, <laughs> about, about your history with music because I, I do think that, as you so beautifully yeah. said, there's some kind of cross section between the art of music and the art of telling a story. Yeah. And um, you explained it beautifully. Right. It's an emotional art, yes. really. Yes. A piece of music, right? Mm -hmm. As well as a as well as uh, literature. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and you just mentioned, you know, when you hit age 70, you thought, oh, this novel. Um, you also said, um, you so you want people to know you published at the age of 76. Yeah. Um, I would love to know. So, so there was a gap, you know, maybe when the story was sort of nesting inside of you for decades or something like yeah, that. Decades. Um, what do you feel like publishing now has given you that you wouldn't have had, say, 30 years ago. Oh, I know the answer to that. had the first, yeah. the first idea of it. At the age of 76 now, it's given me a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of time to, I don't have 20 books in me like a 20 year old might have. Mm -hmm. I hope I have a few more. Um, so I, I, I really feel not panicked, but I keep, I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just so much I have to do. And I've got one novel with my publish uh, with my publisher now. They just received it from my agent, and another um, uh, an outline of my sequel to this book. Yay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and a novella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're busy. I'm busy. busy. Yeah. 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 And you know, another thing that I appreciated about your book is that it's it's not just this event itself that's sort of like this inciting thing. You really take us through the breadth of a life and not just one life but four or five and that seems something that um if you could have been able to do at age 20 in in the way that yeah. you do it yeah yeah maybe yeah. that's true yeah i've always also been fascinated by interlock interlocking short stories or yeah um that take you from one one time period to the other mm -hmm. uh I, this is not that because the arcs of each individual stories are different mm -hmm. but but I like the time lapse, you know, dropping in on these people and then a few years later dropping in and seeing, did they really do what they said they were going to yeah. do? And oh my goodness, did they really do that? And, you know, yeah. life, life is like that. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, from what you read, we get the sense that it's not just Olivia that's kind of telling the story. We're not just seeing the book or the story through Olivia's eyes. We're also yeah. seeing it through uh, both of her sons. Right. right. What was it like or how did you go about telling a story from different points of view. What was that like? I think the fact that I had four sons, mm -hmm. and I was writing about three sons, um, helped me see how different people could be. Well, I, anybody with children, uh, more than one child, can see how different they are growing up in the same environment. Mm -hmm. 
it was a little different writing the book because one son was really not affected that much. He was too young. He was only one or two um, and didn't rem ever remember his mother. And the other son was of an age where he was very wounded by the loss of his mother. Mm -hmm. So they grew up to be quite different people because of what happened to them. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and of course, Olivia's pain, mm -hmm. you know, was very different. And Harry's uh, yeah. father, but I concentrated more on the sons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Olivia, not Harry. And how did you decide when to pass the baton, right, between the characters? Who, who, who gets to say the next part of the story? How did you kind of work on that? Oh, gee. Um, well, I had to plan out their lives. That was fun. <laughs> I wish you could do that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've tried, but um, so I made I made the son who was the baby into a doctor, and he had no psychological problems at all. It just kind of sailed through life. And the other son, different. He was very wounded. He he had problems with relationships and drugs and. And things got better for him eventually. Um, but um, how did I plan them out? I think it was just a natural thing, thinking that this son would be OK and mm -hmm. this son wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And that this father would be mostly focused on helping these children with these individual with their individual characters. Yeah. It's very, you can tell, it's very natural that you kind of spent a lot of time thinking about the characters and who they were and everything sort of flowed out yeah. from that. I think, yeah, in the book. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, another thing I thought a lot about while I was reading was the nature of grief. And what I got from your book, or I think what you taught me is that there isn't one way to grieve. I don't think there's a right way to grieve, you know. Um, what did writing the book teach you about grief? Well, there's one wrong way to do something, and that's not to grieve, I mm. think. And that's what Olivia well, and she grieved, of course she did, but she ran from her grief, which has made it a lot worse for her. She had a very difficult life. Mm -hmm. um, you can't run from grief. You, you take it with you. Yeah. Um, I've never had something really terrible happen to somebody very close to me, other than my parents. Mm -hmm. So I hope, I hope I got it right in this book. Yeah. yeah. Do you as far as grief, or, grief is concerned. Do you think... Olivia finally reaches the point where she's able to grieve in the book, or do you think, do, do you feel like she's kind of running from it for her entire life? I think she's grieving her whole life, mm -hmm. and she's putting it aside and, and trying not to think about it. And in not, in always using her energy to put it aside, she makes choices that she wouldn't have made if she hadn't had, if she had dealt with it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. She tried to have relationships um in her new town and and that didn't work mm -hmm. um she had to live a very lonely life she yeah. didn't want to let people know mm -hmm. uh, what she had done she felt guilty for it um yeah uh she carried her grief her whole life yeah. and she never worked her way through it mm -hmm. and i try to deal with this in the sequel a little bit yeah Ooh. Okay. yeah um, if, what would you say, if there's anybody in the audience who is, wants to write a book that's dealing with heavy topics, whether it's trauma, loss, whatever, what kind of advice would you give, do you think? Well, if a person wanted to read, write something heavy with trauma and loss, it might be because they had had a lot of trauma and loss. Mm -hmm. But say they hadn't, they might try to find people who had. Yeah. Or in this book I interviewed, for this book, I interviewed a psychiatrist. Really? Yeah. Oh. To see, it was, I wasn't getting something right about Olivia. There was something that I needed from this psychiatrist to tell me about uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would, would ask anybody to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or, yeah. or read a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know somebody who's trying to write a book about trauma? <laughs> I, I think everyone I know who's a writer is. Yeah. Because those topics, they come yeah. up and yeah. it's a part of life just as much as joy and hope. Yeah. They're kind of, you can't you can't have one without the other, I think. So right. I think every writer I know is wondering, if I want to accurately write about life, how do I write about those hard things? 
Yeah, after all, if you write about completely happy people, that's not a book, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no arc, as you no, said. No, no, no arc. Piece, right? yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite part of the book? Oh, I knew you would ask me that, and I brought, yes. Yeah? It's, Which part is it's it? It's just a paragraph. Oh, good. Will you read it for us? Sure. Okay. A little context. I guess you can hear me. Okay, I don't have to go up there. Um... Olivia has just run away from her family and she is in the bus going down to New York City from Vermont. And she's thinking to herself, perhaps there is a place where you can run from your family and friends with impunity, a strange and wonderful place where the point isn't to love and be loved so hard that if something happens, you can die of the wounds that love is inflicted. The point Olivia thinks as she begins to nod off is something quite different, although at the moment she can't imagine what it might. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, my favorite line in the book was a question that you asked, and it was, "How do you uncreate a life?" And in that, in the context, you're talking about Olivia. Uh, but what I loved about that line is that it also seemed that that's what's sort of happening to each of the characters as well. You know, the sons sort of are uncreating, and the father really too are uncreating the life that they had in service of how, how you yeah. go on after yeah. something like that. What, when you wrote that line or when you think about it now, what is it? What does it mean to you? Well, I, I think you reach after grief or after something is awful happened, you reach a point where you realize you can't have that life back, that mm -hmm. happy life that you had. Yeah. And so you have to create it again. You have to you have to do things differently. There's some things you can't do. Some things that aren't going to be as meaningful to you as they have been. Um, I mean, Olivia, when she went to her cabin, it was a, an empty cabin and she had to buy things and get things. And she needed to go to the store and, and what store. And she wanted friends and that was difficult. And then she had been teaching piano lessons um and when she went to vermont when she left um she wanted to teach piano lessons again and then music was too painful for her mm -hmm. um so she wasn't able to put that in her life at least not at that point mm -hmm. so it was just look you have to look at your whole life and, and make changes and that's what she had to and so did her husband and yeah. and he's sort of a minor character so i don't get into him much mm -hmm. but but her older son And I mean, as much as you and I have been talking about some of the harder points of the novel, I wanted to also mention there's a lot of life in this book too, right? Good. A lot of life, a lot of um, you know th things that that make people feel fulfilled. Music, I think, being yeah. one of them. One of the things that I really loved was that we get such a great portrait of New York City, but it's not static, right? We see 1980s New York City, yeah, yeah. 1990s, early 2000s. How did you go about getting the city on the page and describing it for the reader at all these different time yeah, periods? Yeah. Well, um, I have a sister who lived in New York, a brother who lived in New York. They left after 9-11. But they were, a bit, they were able to help me with the geography and the kind of stores that would have been in a certain neighborhood. And then there was Mr. Google, Google Maps. <laughs> Maps and, right, I, that's right. and I worked on that. I did... I, I did set a chapter or a section in at 9/11, so I mm -hmm. I used um, my brother and his his husband um, were present then and mm -hmm. we were able to watch it. So and and one of the brothers was watching it on television uh, or was watching just before it happened and how it happened on television. So I viewed through YouTube 9/11. Mm -hmm. um, I viewed Fergie, the, my, uh, one of those minor royals in England. Um, talk about Weight Watchers, and then all of a sudden there was 9 11. Yeah, so I got that in the book, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, it, it just amazed me how much I could get mm -hmm. from 9 11. Everything yeah. was out there, yeah, it was been in New York generally. Mm -hmm. FICO's, I mentioned a place that sold only pork, I don't think it's there anymore, but yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. I, yeah, that was a uh, really it, it was great because by the point 9 11 comes, New York City is sort of its own character in the book, so you can. Yeah. feel it not only for the city but also how the other characters are feeling about it as well yeah. i had to do a lot of research yeah i love that part of mm -hmm. it 
Because and you mentioned so you had you know some siblings. Did they read your work? Do you have family members yeah. that read your work while you're working on it? Those those parts of it. Yeah. How did yeah. that go? What was that like? That was fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another thing that's really interesting in the book is that there's a painting, and you read about it briefly as well, yeah. but um, I would love to know, was that inspired? How did that idea come to you to put the painting in there? Was it inspired by a yeah. real painting? I um, I knew the painting had to be fairly expensive, mm -hmm. and then Olivia had grown up pretty wealthy. Her parents were from England. John Constable was a very famous paint, is a very famous painter. He's dead now, but we can talk about him in the is. Um, and his paintings are very similar and very expensive. And I had to be a little bit creative because I wanted to put a, a boy with a fishing pole into it. Yeah. So he did not really paint that. He painted everything <laughs> around that. Um, but he didn't put the fishing pole in the boy. Right. So, so part of the John Constable painting was done by me. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. It was, it was, you know, it was so yeah. fascinating. Um, were there other either, you know, books or works of art that came alongside you or helped you as you were writing the book? I think most books I've ever read, like from Heidi and um, Eloise on mm -hmm. up to Sally Rooney or Justin Cartwright or something, I'm, I get a lot of inspiration from what I read and what I've read mm -hmm. you know, since I was a child. What are you reading now? I'm reading a book by Edmund Royd. He's in his 80s. It was reviewed really well last week. I'm really enjoying it. I forget the name of it. I got out of the library. Um, have you heard of it? No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. And do you like to read, um, you know, paper copies? Do you do audio? Just to... I don't do audio. Um, my book is out in or is, is coming out in audio. Mm -hmm. but I've never done an audio book. Okay. I like to read. I like the paper for the tree, you know, and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Um, can you tell us? I would love to hear. You know, when you decided, maybe you mentioned it already a little bit about how you decided you wanted to do this writing thing instead of some other venture. Well, I may have given the impression that I started writing when I was 70, but as as Dana um, introduced me, I've been writing for a long time. Right, right. No novels. So, um, what was the question? I'm just curious how you decided that writing was, was the path you wanted to go down because it's it's not a traditional path. There's lots of ups and downs, right? Yeah. You don't know if you're going to be able to publish your book, and um, after you put all this work yeah. into it, so it it takes the kind of um, uh, steel-hearted reserve, I think, to say yeah. I'm going to give this a go. So I would just love to hear about that I process that. for you. I when I decided I wanted to write, I didn't want to self-publish. I wanted to go the traditional way, and the whole goal was to publish. That was my whole goal. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a friend in Canada who writes, she writes children's books and she writes little things for adults and, and, and she's very clever, but she absolutely does not want to get published. She yeah. doesn't want that. She doesn't want to be turned down. And I was willing to be turned down. Oh, I was yeah. turned down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what was the process of, of getting your finished draft and then to publication? What was that road like? Well, I have read that, that the age is in place as part in when, when somebody as old as me uh, writes a debut novel or anything at all and that it's very hard to get an agent. That was the hardest part, getting mm -hmm. an agent. I sent it to so many people. I might have taken almost a year to get an agent. Yeah. After that, it was a piece of cake. It took a month or less mm -hmm. to get it published. Oh. But I was, I was always disappointed every time I was turned down. Yeah. And, but I just was gonna. I'd still be looking for an agent now, mm -hmm. and still be trying to do it if if I had. Yeah. Take like, some time. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. determined. Yeah. 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 And you talked about this a little bit, but what's next for you? Would you say? What's next for me? Yeah. Well, I've, you know, I've got the the novel. It's called Alice Turning. That that was just given to my publisher, and I've got the sequel, and I've got the sequel of oh, five chapters done. Um, oh wow. And I know where it's going. It's much more outlined than the other book because I have all the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we know them all. And and then there's another small book that I started to write with my brother. I wanted to, well, I don't want to tell the plot, but there's lots going on that, that I want to do in the future. Yeah, I hope I get to do it. That's exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. 
I just have one last question maybe before we um, open it up to the mm -hmm. audience, but I would love to hear what you hope stays with your readers after they finish the last page of the book. Um, I just would hope they would all be thinking, damn, that old lady can write well. <laughs> 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 I think Dana's going to come up and. Um, yeah, so at this time, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll pass you the mic. Or any questions from our virtual audience? I'll ask a question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the Olivia mic, or can we wrong? Just in yes. case. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was struck when you were asked about the hard choice that Olivia made, because I didn't feel that she made a hard choice. I felt like she had a mental breakdown. You but mentioned that she had. I felt like. Let me take this off. Yeah. I felt like she had had a mental breakdown rather than made a choice when she walked away. And for that reason, I, I had trouble with her husband not trying to find her. Um, and that just drove me crazy through the whole book. I couldn't forget him. And when he explained to his son that he thought it was un would be unkind yeah, to find yeah, her, yeah. it didn't cut it for me. And I just wonder if you had the same problem with him. Um, he actually, he didn't, when he realized that she was still alive, mm -hmm. and I got, um, he did, he decided that he knew that he shouldn't do it. That wasn't hard for me. I thought that that, that might happen. I mean, that would have been a very painful choice for him. But what could he see? What could he say? How would he welcome back into his life this woman who did this, what many people think was an awful thing? How would that relationship have gone? Right? It would have been a mess, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I love the book, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Pennington Police helped me very much with, yeah. um, with uh, I went into them and said, if this was 1973 and <laughs> and somebody left their family and she was a missing person and they wanted you to find her and say you found her and and she said to you do not you can tell my family that i'm okay but don't tell them where i am are you legally bound were you legally bound in 73 not to tell them and they were back in 73. Are there any other questions? So where do you do, you said you write on your laptop. Do you do still most of your writing from home or are you one of the writers like, I know we have a lot of writers here at the library that like to come and write just to get away or the other writers say that they like to go to coffee shops. Is there like a favorite writing place? And then also uh, we're talking a lot about the research. Um, do you just, have you done like any kind of in-person research or are you largely relying on internet or you know, what's your research process like to get things right? Well, I think with the police, I, I actually went down to the police station. I went in like this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I wrote, like I, I got research done at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they were very kind and answered my questions. So it was mostly online or, or through emails. As far as my writing is concerned, I wrote this book in this library upstairs. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know what you call that room. You go upstairs and it's at the very end. On the right, there's it glassed in and long take the reading room. <laughs> I loved <laughs> writing there. <laughs> um, because when I was reading, I couldn't go and make cookies then. And, you know, like, we'll go over to my plants. And, and I was able to write a lot better there. Since um, I wrote that book, though, we moved from one house in Lawrenceville to, to Pennington, and I, I was able to get my own study. So that's where I write now. Was there another one, or was, did I cover it? Do you, like to, do you like to write in the morning? It sounds like you edit maybe at night, but no. when, when's your time that you like to write? Afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Although sometimes when I really get going good, um, I'm writing all day but that kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> it's not a very balanced life to do that. So. Any other last minute questions from maybe the virtual audience? I, I can say that you're getting a lot of love from the virtual audience. People are joining from 
Canada and Minnesota and Pennsylvania and Princeton. So, um, and everyone's like, hello, hi, Jean. <laughs> I couldn't hear any of that. Oh, there's lots of love online on, on from Crowdcast. People from all over logging in saying, hi, Bobby. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi, 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 Whole, the difficulty of the yeah. past two years is that we figured out how you can do an event and have people yeah, come to yeah. Canada and yeah. you great. know be able to be a part of it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Any others? Any last minute? No? Well, at this time then, um, Labyrinth Books is here selling Bobby Jean's book. If anybody would like to purchase a copy, she's going to be over there signing them um, in just a moment. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.